Hey, Dr. Joe here. And so today I want to cover a little bit about depression and more specifically, what is the best supplement for depression? I get this all the time. I get uh, a lot of questions on Facebook and we get a lot of emails and those emails are basically like, Hey, uh, I know that you do a lot of lab testing and do a lot with supplements. What is your favorite supplement for such and such condition, joint pain, multiple sclerosis, and depression, right, for example. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna to share that with you. So um, it's gonna be a little bit of a longer video, and uh, but I really wanna dive into a little bit of the um, physiology of depression, explain it a little bit, and then talk about you know my favorite supplement. So here we go. So the main topic we're discussing today is depression. So let's share the screen here. Okay. So imagine neurons, okay? Oh, I know some of you are just like glazing over and uh, the eyes are rolling back in your head already because I'm going to start talking about neurology. But really, this can be very basic and very exciting. So here we go. I'm a neuron. And this neuron fires into this neuron. We'll say neuron one. Fires into neuron two. Fires into neuron three. Now let's make neuron three just a little bit bigger just so I can draw some more stuff in it. Okay, here's neuron three. Now typically it's not gonna be that much bigger, but just for the example, I'm gonna draw a little thing in here, an M called an essential mitochondria. Now that's where we make energy, okay? So neuron one fires into neuron two. Neuron two fires into neuron three. Neuron three releases serotonin or like let's say dopamine, okay? And then neuron four gets activated and we're happy. That's how that works, okay? We have this frequency of firing of a circuit and that circuit is responsible for things like mood, for things like behavior, for how we see, how we smell, how we taste, how we're motivated. Okay, all these things have neurotransmitters that carry out the signaling of these neurons, right? So like right away, people will start talking about genetically um, what's going on, right? So, you know, it's true. Some people will have like receptor issues here on like one of these neurons where the neuron doesn't respond well to like dopamine or respond well to serotonin. And so they're gonna be more likely to be depressed or um, anxious, for example, right? Or maybe like after the serotonin and dopamine are done here, they get broken down and they get returned back into the, the neuron that fired it. Well, some people have issues with that. It's called reuptake, okay? And there are drugs like reuptake inhibitors that can address that a little bit and that can increase the amount of time these neurotransmitters spend in between the neurons and that can increase the frequency of firing of the neuron and make people happy. That's the theory, right? Okay. Some people have just more efficient mitochondria, which means they can make more energy than other people, okay? So that's another thing. So genetically, yeah, there's definitely a lot of genetic things at play here, for sure. So some people, all things, all things considered, will go through some serious stress and come out okay. Other people will go through some serious stress and they're gonna come out like not very good, okay? And some people will undergo some mild stress and come out not very good for the same reason, to some of these genetic predispositions, okay? That doesn't mean their genes are their fate, it just means that they might need to be a little more careful with who they let in their circle, and they might need to do other things that maximize brain function to accommodate for that or account for that. Does that make sense? All right. Now, did you know that for every one of these neurons, there's 10 other neurons? And they're called glial cells. Now, glial cells 
literally glial is Latin for glue. Okay. And we used to think that glial cells were the cells that held these other neurons that actually carried out the signals together. That's all they did. But as it turns out, glial cells are more than just glue. They are immune cells. So 90% of the brain is immune, which is really, really, really a big deal. Okay, we're gonna see that a little bit later. But the glial cells, they start out like this, with these like tentacles. Those are happy glial cells, they're called ramified, okay? Glial cells that are unhappy, don't have the little tentacles anymore, they look more like a fried egg. Those are called primed. Okay, so let's say a neuron here, neuron one, has a bunch of primed glial cells or activated glial cells. They're no longer ramified. Did you know that the underlying neuron won't fire very well? So if neuron one doesn't fire very well, what's gonna happen to neuron two? It won't work. What's gonna happen to neuron three? It's not gonna work as good. Now, granted, each one of these neurons have thousands and thousands and thousands of other neurons synapsing on it, but you can kind of see what can happen here, right? These glial cells become vital to the activation or the healthy activation of the brain so that we can have a good mood. Okay, more on that later. The key deal that I really want to discuss today, the, the kind of the center of this whole thing, is the mitochondria. See that big M in neuron number three there? Now, the mitochondria is what makes energy. Okay, and when we make energy, that means we have enough batteries to fire the neuron. And so, what can happen is the mitochondria stop working. And what causes the mitochondria to stop working? It's kind of a long story, but the simple answer is inflammation. Inflammation is one really uh, straightforward answer that we can use to describe this, okay? Okay, so now we come back to here. And let's just close this up here. And move this guy up here to the mitochondria, right? We're really focused on the mitochondria. We know inflammation will negatively impact the mitochondria. Okay, inflammation. Now, in the literature, it talks a lot about people that are non responsive. Okay, non responsive. And what does that mean exactly? So let's say they do um, uh, talk therapy or they do. Um, SSRIs like Prozac or something, or they do Welbuterin, which is um, reuptake inhibitor of dopamine and uh, another neurotransmitter, and it just isn't working. So they're called resistant cases, okay? And so in the literature, there's a lot of talk about cytokines. Cytokines are immune signalers. Well, guess what? Might the immune signaling from inflammation affect these glial cells? And another thing inflammation does is it goes to the mitochondria, and it creates a decrease in energy production. And when there's a decrease in energy production, the neuron doesn't fire. When the neuron doesn't fire, the person will not have the output of the neurotransmitter. When they don't have the output of the neurotransmitter and the signaling, there's no signaling. Without signaling, there's actually no activity. There's a depressed activity. Okay? So all things being equal, a person who is relatively healthy, but they're in a lockdown situation where they're not moving as much, they're not even like walking to the car, they're not walking from the car to their office anymore, they're not walking to the grocery store, they're not doing much of anything other than working from home and hanging at home, okay? They're losing activity into their brain. So they're losing frequency of firing of those neurons, okay? When you don't fire the neuron, you don't activate the mitochondria and make energy. 
So that's one way the mitochondria can fail. And then if you have inflammation systemically or brain inflammation, then the mitochondria will not work as well. Okay, so here's the deal. When you hear the words neuroinflammation, I want you to think brain fog, okay? So like if you're just sitting around and uh, like in the afternoon, you just have brain fog, you can't think straight, that is neuroinflammation due to these glial cells right here. And try as you may to activate your brain with like caffeine or like maybe a starch or something to try to give you a boost, that brain fog just doesn't go away. And that brain fog is due to those activated glial cells now not working, okay? And so that becomes an immune issue. This happens a lot after people like eat and they get really tired after they eat and they have to sleep and they get brain fog. That is an insulin-based inflammatory event, okay? So what if somebody had a serotonin issue? Well, what would that look like? So the signaling issue here, what would that look like? Well, okay, let's talk about that for a second. So this is a form that I use in my office and it was put together by a colleague of mine, Datis Karazian. Um, and uh, he uh, gives us permission to use it. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Karazian. And so here's section 10 of the uh, Brain Health Nutrition Assessment Form. And this, all these questions here are related to serotonin. Loss of pleasure, pleasure in hobbies and interests, feeling overwhelmed with ideas to manage, feelings of inner rage and unprovoked anger, feelings of paranoia. Hey, do you know anybody right now that's maybe just a little bit paranoid all of a sudden? You know what I'm saying? Like in the absence of any real data, are just freaking out about things that may or may not be even true. Do you know anybody like that right now? Hey, low serotonin. Okay. Um, a loss of enjoyment in life, a lack of artistic appreciation, feelings of sadness and overcast weather. Um, that could be the so-called, uh, um, like gray sky depression. And, and so basically, um, that also could be a melatonin issue, right? Seasonal affective disorder. Okay, loss of enthusiasm for favorite activities. So like a lot of people in lockdown aren't really interested in talking to their friends. They're not really interested in doing a lot of the stuff they used to do. They're not interested in learning as much. They're not interested in even watching their favorite shows or playing games. They're not really interested in much right now, okay? A loss of enjoyment in favorite foods, a loss of enjoyment in friendships and relationships. A lot of relationships falling apart right now. Uh, inability to fall into deep restful sleep, feelings of dependency on others and feelings of susceptibility to pain. That's really a big one. And so like, you'll see like when people have really chronic pain, um, it stops becoming a physiological only thing. Like if the knee hurts, it's not just like knee inflammation at some point, it actually becomes uh, a chronic pain syndrome, which lives in the brain. It's not in your head when that happens. It just means it's now a neurological thing, which is why body work alone often fails for chronic pain issues. And literally the serotonin levels drop and that doesn't allow the brain to modulate pain. So for example, just as just a quick aside, we have all of these pain fibers. They're called C fibers. They're firing into our anxiety center all the time. Like they constantly fire, but they're slow. So like what ends up happening is, is we have uh, uh, another fiber that fires at the exact same time as that pain fiber from the exact same location. And it runs ahead and it gets to the brain and it says, look, there's a C fiber coming. It's gonna say we're hurting, but we're actually okay. And what can happen is, is that myelinated pathway, that fast pathway can be damaged. That's one mechanism of chronic pain. And another mechanism is, the area of the brain that actually receives that information can become dysregulated due to one mechanism is a serotonergic problem. So you'll see like some of the pain meds out there aren't actually for inflammation, they're actually just to make the brain not care anymore, okay? And that's why there's a super high addictive quality. Like you don't see people as much get addicted to Advil or addicted to Tylenol or addicted to prednisone, which is an immune anti-inflammatory, but there's a higher addiction quality to um, opiates, right? And, and it's because of the influence it has on the brain and just not caring, okay? That's what it does. It basically 
makes up for this loss of serotonin so that when the pain gets there, the body processes in a way that isn't as painful. Anyway, that's just a quick aside. If we go to the next section here, wow, look at that. Section 11, those are, those are questions that um, are related to dopamine. So on the one hand, low serotonin, you might have like a depression that's more of a weepy depression or even a guilty depression. Like, wow, I, uh, I actually am blessed. I get my groceries delivered to my house right now. You know, yeah, granted I'm locked up, but I have the wherewithal to buy groceries. Um, I'm, you know, financially secure with unemployment or, you know, I have, I can still go to work um, or I have enough to get by for now. Um, I have a roof over my head, right? I'm not homeless right now. And, um, you know, my relationship's really good. Um, I'm able to keep an eye on my kids and make sure they're safe right now. And so like, I don't know, like, yeah, granted, it's kind of stressful being locked up, but like, I pretty much have everything I need. I just feel guilty. I'm depressed about that. Okay. Or the person outside of COVID, like they just have everything in life. They have the perfect partner or they're alone and they love it. They have the perfect job. They get to travel or stay home as they wish. They're financially independent. And yet they still feel guilty because just whatever it is, it's not enough. Okay. That, that's low serotonin. And then on the other hand, you have the dopamine depression, which is like uh, the agitated depression or the angry depression. Okay. Uh, that's the person who, um, you know, can't wait in line, um, is kind of irritated and, and, and agitated with everything and um, has trouble getting motivated or, or completing tasks. And that person might be more likely to be addicted to things like uh, alcohol or tobacco or uh, chocolate is a big one. Okay. Uh, red wine is more of a dopaminergic thing. Okay. So like if you're like a red wine person, got to have that red wine just to feel normal. Um, could be this dopamine issue, right? So if we take that story and look at this form, and then we go back to this story here. Related to dopamine and serotonin. Okay, so here we go. Now we can match symptoms with neurotransmitter output. Okay, so the medical model um, is really focused on, you know, for depression on the neurotransmitters. And then the alternative model might be focused on nutrition for neurotransmitters. So instead of doing like Prozac or Wellbuterin, they might do like tryptophan, which is a serotonin precursor, or uh, tyrosine, DL tyrosine, or like Mucuno, which can you know, relate to dopamine, right? Or they'll self-medicate. For serotonin, they might self-medicate with like sugar to just pump up their uh, serotonin levels due to like an insulin surge. Or um, for dopamine, like I said, red meat, tobacco, red wine, chocolate, things like that, okay? Or actual drugs like methamphetamine, okay? And then like things like wilbunerin, things like that. So like we have, we know in the alternative model and the nutritional model, we know there are things that are precursors of serotonin and dopamine. But let me ask you this. What does focusing on serotonin and dopamine here do at all, really, to affect this? Okay, and what does that do necessarily, specifically, to affect the glial cells? And what does it do specifically to affect the mitochondria? I mean, certainly the neurotransmitter precursor or the reuptake inhibition can allow a little bit of more of excitation of that neuron, okay? Or a little more substrate so that's available to excite, but it really doesn't address these factors. So like, where is this inflammation coming from? Okay, well, what if you have like a metabolic issue? So what's metabolic? Let's say like uh, diabetes, or like a blood sugar disturbance, or like anemia. Iron deficient anemia, B12 deficient anemia, pernicious anemia, you see it all the time. I mean, I'll run labs on people and this is super, super, super common anemias, right? But like how many people actually have full-blown diabetes? You're like, look, I don't have diabetes, I'm already off this video, boom, done. Okay, listen, if you're tired after you eat and you get brain fog, I'm talking to you. Tired after you eat is an insulin surge, likely, especially if it's a carbohydrate meal. 
insulin surge, creating an inflammatory event. That inflammation will affect these glial cells and it'll affect the mitochondria both. Okay, what about hormones? Make them a different color, hormones. Okay, what am I talking about here? Well, we already talked a little bit about blood sugar, but about insulin, because blood sugar by itself causes advanced glycosylated end products, which are promoters of inflammation. That's the hemoglobin A1C, if you've ever done lab testing for that. Insulin, cortisol, which is stress hormone. And then another huge one is thyroid hormone, and then sex hormones. Anybody you know get depressed, like as part of a premenstrual event? Has you ever, have you ever heard of that before? Or like maybe during ovulation, like a little more weepy or depressed? Any, anybody ever heard of that? Or like, have you ever heard of anybody in menopause who got significantly depressed when their hormone levels dropped? Have you ever heard of anybody in perimenopause where they're in between normal hormone cycling and menopause, like just basically losing their minds? I mean, I'm saying that seriously, like they get severe anxiety, it severely impacts their work, it severely impacts all their relationships, it severely impacts their marriage, okay, and their life can be significantly, significantly damaged from that. You ever heard of that? Okay, so that, that's a real thing, that's impacting brain. Okay, what about like, uh, have you ever heard of gut issues? Gut, so like IBS. What about like uh, dysbiosis? So taking antibiotics, having like a candida overgrowth. So we'll, we'll just say infection. So infection could be, um, we'll say candida. We'll say uh, H. pylori. Or like if you've been to like um, traveling and you've got uh, Montezuma's Revenge, so like Giardia is a good one. Or like maybe a parasite from eating too much sushi. sushi or not washing your vegetables, right? Those are all really uh, significant causes of gut infections, okay? Um, what about, uh, what else causes inflammation in the brain? What about like a traumatic brain injury? So like a history of an old concussion or whiplash? Listen, once these glial cells here turn into an egg, they never turn back. They're always going to be there. Okay, and so things like poor sleep, um, alcohol, if you notice that poor sleep and alcohol just make your depression come back with a vengeance, that tells you you have neuroinflammation. Okay, um, what about, uh, what else do you want to talk about here? What about just straight up infection? Okay, so like things like, um, if you ever had mono, strep, Epstein-Barr virus is, is mono, a cytomegalovirus, cytomegalovirus. okay, uh, herpes simplex one is a big time neuroinflammatory. A lot of people that don't even have symptoms of herpes, like from an STI, have really high uh, herpes levels in their brain, and that's where their depression is coming from. Did you know that? Okay, herpes simplex six, or not simplex, but herpes virus six. Okay, these are just some examples. So a person could have a virus in the brain that's causing inflammation in the brain. That inflammation in the brain is causing the glial cells to um, not tend to the neurons, so that decreases the frequency of firing. And then they have um, decreased mitochondria activity from the inflammation as well, and so they don't produce the serotonin and dopamine. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and then a person could have just frank um, autoimmunity. Okay, autoimmunity to the brain. So like you could actually have other white blood cells that attack dopamine and serotonin, that attack the terminal that releases it, that attacks the axon or the myelin that coats the axon, or that attacks the nucleus or the, the mitochondria, okay? You could have autoimmunity to basically any of these. Okay, so like an example of autoimmune to the brain would be multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's. So if you're noticing like when you get brain fog and you're, you're like depressed that you're 
face also tingles a little bit or your foot tingles a little bit or you're feeling like your muscles are a little bit weak and you've gone to the doctor and they're like, oh, you have MS. And then they check you for MS. You don't have MS, but you have like on your MRI, like white patchy matter in the area of your brain that uh, is responsible for where the tingling is. It's, it's, here's the deal. You could have 50% tissue destruction, but it doesn't qualify for a diagnosis of MS. You might need 75% or more before a neurologist would be like, oh yes, this person has MS. And then you go down the treatment of MS, which is basically immunosuppression, which does what? Suppresses inflammation. Can you see where we're going with this? Okay, so then um, a person could have autoimmunity to their brain or they could just have autoimmunity to like their joints, like RA or their stomach, right? Um, that's pernicious anemia. They might have gastric ulcers from that. Now, if you have stomach ulcers and you're getting anemia, then you're gonna have low oxygen. You're gonna create a metabolic issue. So you're gonna get inflammation from the stomach damage and you're gonna get inflammation from the anemia and you're gonna get low oxygen to the brain from the anemia. So you're just gonna get hammered from this anemia like five different ways, even though I only mentioned three, okay? I was told there'd be no math. I know this is my video, but you know what I'm getting at here? Okay, um, another thing. So like, what about um, exercise? Okay, so like the perfect amount of exercise, as you know, people a lot of times exercise, they feel better because they're activating these circuits and the neurons work better. But what about exercise? If you overtrain, which a ton of people do, or you're deconditioned, you could get inflammation. What about what everybody's dealing with to some level right now? Okay, social stress. Okay, so like going to that wedding. Okay, going to that uh, homecoming. Going to that uh, job interview. Okay, going to that seminar. Um, or being isolated against what feels comfortable to you. Okay, this is not even just my opinion, like this is all over the literature. Social stress will create a neurological inflammation by itself. So a lot of you right now are depressed because you are living a life of forced shelter in place. It's not the same thing as being in prison. It's not the same thing, but it is a uh, impediment to your free will and what you would like to do with your day, right? You're making a decision to stay home for the benefit of others, or you're making a decision to go out because you feel like uh, that's not within your value system. And I'm not making any comments about what's right or wrong there. I'm just saying people that are going out are still facing stress because they're not having to validate themselves to everybody else. People that are staying home are stressed because they would like to be doing other things. They're worried about their jobs. They're stuck in a toxic relationship or they're completely lonely, or they're now doing a bunch of things like homeschooling their kids while still trying to do their normal work, their normal work hours, but doing it at home, like completely stressed out of their minds, okay? And that stress by itself creates inflammation. And then the ability to um, ignore that elevation of cortisol or stress hormone creates more inflammation. So you have the initial just psychological stress of so the neurogenic stress of the event, and then you have the downstream effects of the high cortisol, which is stress hormone, its influence on the immune system inflammation and we're off to the races these are just loops okay um so we talked about infection we talked about brain infection we know that these infections not only can create inflammation in the brain but they can hide in neurons which can lead to neuron destruction that way or they can literally cause the immune system to attack the neuron because they're mistaken that the um neuron is, is the actual bug. So a good example of this would be like strep throat. Um, strep throat can lead to uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. It's very well known in the literature. And so like if the immune system thinks your neuron is a bacteria, it's gonna attack it unless something else stops it. Okay, so let's go back to the original question. All right, so what's my favorite supplement for depression? Okay. So let's go to the next page so I can answer that. Okay, so we have, um, we'll put inflammation here.
Oh, I forgot to mention on the previous page. Related to the gut stuff, we have all the food stuff, right? Food. So we have things like uh, some foods are very well known in the literature to contribute to more neurological stuff. A, a big one that comes to mind is like gluten, right? And gluten is uh, part of a wheat protein. And then there's something called agglutinin, which is a lectin part of wheat protein. And agglutinin is not gluten. They're different. So people could do like a gluten test for, uh, you know, inflammation and they come back normal, but they didn't do the agglutinin test. And so they missed an opportunity to really understand what's driving that. So like, okay, so let's go back to the next page. Okay, so we have food issues, we have gut issues, we have infection issues, we have uh, autoimmune issues, we have um, training issues like um, exercise deconditioning or overtraining issues. Okay, so we'll say fitness. We have metabolic issues like blood sugar issues and anemias. We have hormone issues like thyroid, um, stress hormone sex hormones. Okay, another thing I didn't mention is how the liver's working. Hormonal, so we'll say liver slash gallbladder. Um, and then we have glial cell issues, so we'll just say neuroinflammation issues, independent of systemic inflammation. Okay, so these are little pluses. So food issues plus uh, um, infection plus autoimmunity plus undertraining or overtraining, plus metabolic issues like anemia and blood sugar disturbance, um, plus liver and gallbladder issues, okay, uh, plus neuroinflammation equals an inflammatory event that can cause depression. Okay, so that's the formula. So what's my favorite supplement to deal with this? A lot of people are like, oh, it's gonna be anti-inflammatory. I know, I know, it's gonna be anti-inflammatory. And here's the reality. Folks, inflammation is a survival signal. The inflammation is designed to protect you. It's supposed to alert you that there's a problem so that you can identify what's going on over here, make the lifestyle change, make the lifestyle change that's actually going to remediate the inflammatory event and then things can go back to normal. That's the patient dream is that um, they just take an anti-inflammatory Advil or some drug, or maybe they do a crash diet, they lower their inflammation, and then everything goes back to normal. Okay, but here's the reality. Inflammation is a self-amplifying loop, meaning it creates more inflammation somewhere else, and then it comes back and it increases itself, and it's a plastic loop. Okay, so if I meet somebody who's been inflamed for 20 years, it's different, completely different prognosis and a completely different scenario than a person that's been inflamed for two weeks. If I meet somebody with every single one of these variables on a scale of zero to 10, like an eight or more, that is a completely different prognosis. It's a completely different treatment strategy and it's a completely different timetable than somebody who has one or two of these things that's very severe. Okay, so hey, listen, there is a nutrition and lifestyle intervention for food. There's a nutrition and lifestyle intervention for gut. There's a nutrition and lifestyle intervention or drug intervention for, infection, for infectious disease. There is a drug or a nutritional way to support immune physiology there is a absolutely a way to dial in on fitness so that you're not overtraining or deconditioned. There is a definitely a way to look at metabolic issues like blood sugar issues with forms and with labs. And there's ways you can supplement and make dietary changes that can become permanent lifestyle changes to get on top of that. And you can supplement and do things to address anemias provided you address the underlying cause of the anemia. It's not just enough to give iron or just enough to give B12 is to understand what's driving it. Let's say a person has a anemia and their cells are too big because they have a B12 issue. 
maybe you've heard of this methylation issue called MTHFR, right? Maybe they have an MTHR issue, and so now they can't really methylate their B12, and so they have macrocytic anemia. That's completely different than a person who has an overgrowth of H. pylori in their stomach, not allowing them to absorb B12, creating a macrocytic anemia, which is basically pernicious anemia. One's an autoimmune condition, one is genetic. One is a simple B12 supplement. One is a dynamic process of addressing an infection and then dealing with the autoimmunity. Totally different. Still the metabolic variable, okay? We start looking at liver and gallbladder issues, like people with chronic skin issues or can't absorb fat, their stools are floating, or they like have really significant supplement and drug reactions all the time. They're very sensitive to supplements. They're very sensitive to drugs. They fall apart. Uh, they gain weight really easy when they take supplements or drugs, okay? Uh, they're chemically sensitive. That person is telling you they have a liver or gallbladder issue. That's gonna create a systemic inflammation, okay? So basically, the neuroinflammatory person who has um, difficulty uh, when they don't sleep very well, they fall apart when they exercise too hard, they fall apart when they do anything for too long, and they fall apart if they uh, drink alcohol or have too much starch, okay? So like, tell me now, please, um, those of you who are asking me, and I think it's a really fair question, okay? And the, here's the deal, like, some people are like, literally like, will pull me aside at seminars and they, they will want me to be like, come on, man, just tell me what the number one supplement is. Or I'll get emails, just like, I loved your, your uh, thyroid video, can you just tell me the best thyroid supplement? By the way, if you have a hormonal issue, is it a cortisol issue? Is it a testosterone issue? If you're a male or female and you have a testosterone issue, that's gonna be totally different nutritional or lifestyle support. Do you understand? So what is my favorite supplement for depression? My favorite supplement is gonna be the supplement that addresses the most egregious variable that's gonna get the greatest response. And then when the dust settles, transition them to the next greatest variable that's left. It's like long division. Okay, so now I just divide uh, this inflammation by, um, see if I can do it here. I divide inflammation by um, infection. And so could, now the infection's gone. We take this variable away. Okay, the person's still depressed because they don't have infection anymore. Okay, but they still have um, gut issues. They still have food sensitivities. They still have autoimmunity and they're doing nothing for it. So that person's gonna go ahead and, and they're gonna um, take those antibiotics or they're gonna take that uh, you know, undecinic acid for candida and they're gonna be like, it didn't do anything for me. You suck. <laughs> okay, maybe I do suck, okay? But maybe it's just a much bigger issue. And I think where I failed the most as a doctor um, is, is creating realistic expectations of response to care. You know what I'm saying? Like I think the patient dream and the doctor dream is that we're gonna find one thing and we're gonna make that one change and very quickly, things are gonna happen and then that's it, okay? But the reality is like, yes, we do, say, we do see, see things happen very, very, very quickly sometimes. It is humbling, it is amazing how quickly things can happen when you stimulate the right part of the brain and you help people do the right diet at the right time and you help people identify lifestyle factors and they can change those things and in the short term you see these huge changes. But at the end of the day, if nothing changes, and they go back to whatever lifestyle factor was driving their inflammation, then nothing's going to change. And so there's no amount of drugs, there's no surgery, there's no amount of singular supplements that's going to do it. And so the whole purpose of me making this video is to try to say this, we need to, as a field, if you're a clinician in the field, move out of the protocol based, this is my opinion, move out of the protocol based single nutrient deficiency idea that that is what's going on or like i'm going to do like i didn't even mention this environmental compounds creating uh neuroinflammation like plastic or metals like there we have doctors out there who are doing great work okay but they think every single person needs metal chelation as their only thing that they're going to do with them and that absolutely misses the boat on what could be the biggest factors for that client at that moment Okay. And so like that person may go with high hopes, spend a lot of money 
actually get better because the metal did what it was supposed to do, got out of the body, but then the expectation of these other variables was never addressed. And so the client still feels like emotionally like they just wasted their time and money, which they may or may not have at that particular time. Okay. So the other thing I just want to mention here is that inflammation is good. We're supposed to have it, but if we do have it, we can do things to calm it down nutritionally. But if we don't address these variables, it's just going to come back to bite you. And it's almost like if you just lower inflammation and then keep your lifestyle the same, the rebound depression that will come with that, the rebound pain, the rebound anxiety, whatever it might be that the inflammation is driving is going to be tremendous. And some of you have experienced that. Where like you've gone to a doctor, they put you on something like turmeric or resveratrol, something anti-inflammatory, maybe just taking a lot of um, aspirin or Advil even, or prednisone. And it's like, oh my gosh, I see the light. I'm back to my old self. Peace out. And then wham, you get hit with it again. And it's like the most severe depression or pain you've ever had in your life. And it's because these other factors were never addressed. And I want you to know that you can use forms, exam in labs, and you can actually walk through a case, identify each one of these variables, each one of these loops on a scale of mild, moderate to severe, and get on top of this. And the reason I made this video now is because, is because so many people are, are socially isolating, and that's becoming stressful and pro-inflammatory. And that pro-inflammatory signaling loop can become a plastic permanent loop, where some people will always need to account for that in their plan. They're not going back to normal after this. And I wanna share that with you, maybe to help you find some motivation to get out there and move a little bit, okay? Because some of you have become a little sedentary, you've been a little more reliant on starches, you've been really stressed out in your relationships or about finances, and you're not exercising at all. And your sleep is getting all crazy. And um, these bad habits create inflammatory signaling that can become permanent and plastic. You can get spreading of your autoimmunity, and it's not like you can just go reset it when this is all over and you're going to be the same person you were coming out as you were going in. That's why I'm making this video today. If you feel stuck here and you're looking for help, I want you to know there are some great, great clinicians out there doing this kind of work. If you'd like me to take a look at this with you, let me know. Reach out to me here and we'll get something set up. Okay. I hope you have a great day and I hopefully you can uh, appreciate now why when people like especially on social media are like just answer the question tell me what my best diet is tell me what my best supplement is tell me what the best thing for depression is tell me what the best thing is for Hashimoto's tell me what the best thing is for joint pain that I cannot answer that question without more data there's just no way so next week on social media here I'm going to be um, creating a case and going through what this looks like in a clinical setting okay I hope you have a great evening take care